Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here, as you say. Uh, two fairly miserable weeks chugging around <laughs> France, reporting on England at the, uh, at the European Championships, so um, it's good to be back. Um, I had a day at Wimbledon today, which was a sort of nice palate cleanser before, uh, before tonight. And nothing ever changes at Wimbledon, you know, kind of uh, the rest of the world is falling apart, but inside SW19, it's fine. Um, we've got a really esteemed panel here tonight to talk about doping in sport, which obviously is a subject I end up covering a lot. I mean, um, my job these days seems to be as much about corruption, cheating, um, and, uh, and doping as it is about the actual uh, sport on the, on the pitch. Um, and I think we have had something of a sort of perfect storm over the last couple of years, probably from the Lance Armstrong um, revelations onwards. Um, it feels like there's just been one thing after another that sort of caused people to um, call sport into question and look at sport in a different way. So as I say, got three really uh, good speakers on the topic. They're each going to speak for about 10 minutes each. Um, and then uh, after we've had another glass of wine, we'll have a discussion and involve all of you as much as possible and uh, hopefully have a good debate. So uh, going from my immediate left, we've got Professor Chris Cooper, who's a professor of biochemistry at the University of Essex. Um, his research is all about oxygen gas in biology and medicine. He's an expert on sports doping, and I do commend his uh, excellent book, uh, Run, Swim, Throw, Cheat. Uh, he's got a blog of the same name, so please do look that up. I, uh, I do so on a regular basis. Um, uh, for, next to him, we've got Andy Meyer, who's chairing uh, Science, Communication and Digital Media uh, at the School of Environmental and Life Sciences at the University of Salford and wins tonight's award for the longest title. Um, <laughs> he's uh, worked on several books as author or co-author, including Genetically Modified Athletes, uh, The Medicalization of Cyberspace, uh, contributed to um, scores of academic articles and appeared at many conferences and is heading to Rio for the Olympics shortly, which we were just discussing. And on the end there, we've got uh, Nicole Sapstead, who's Chief Executive of UK Anti-Doping and has had a very busy job recently. She was appointed in 2015 to succeed Andy Parkinson, who obviously knew something that she <laughs> didn't. Um, and, but she'd been at UCAD for a long time before that, um, since its formation in 2009. And she's worked in the anti-doping space since 1998 at King's College and then at UK Sport, which became UCAD on its uh, formation in uh, 2009 ahead of the London Olympics. So I'd like to pass over to, to Chris first of all and then uh, each of you in turn. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, Owen. So I guess, as Owen said, I'm a scientist who over recent years has developed an interest in sports doping. Um, and it's actually quite a difficult thing to study as a scientist because you want to do the sort of randomised, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial in the athlete to see does a drug work or not. And I guess for obvious reasons it's really hard to do that. I mean, as a scientist, I really want to inject who is proposed an EPO into an elite athlete without telling them and see what happens. But um, perhaps for good reason, my ethics committee won't let me do that, and I think neither, neither will UK anti-doping. <laughs> so I do the best I can, and I'll try and talk to you about what I, what I know and what is out there. So as a, as a true teacher, I'm going to sort of visualize. So I'm going to start with blood. So here's a bag of blood. Um, and this kind of thing, blood, blood transfusions, um, EPO has been used probably in sports since the 1970s, certainly the 1980s. Um, to improve the amount of oxygen you can deliver to your muscles, so long-distance aerobic sports, long-distance running, cycling. Um, originally, it wasn't banned. Then it became banned, and they couldn't really test for it. And now, as you probably heard, it's one of the most hotly contested areas about how can you test whether people are using blood transfusions, EPO, or not. Um, the second thing, I didn't bother to go out and buy any anabolic steroids, but here's Arnie using some anabolic steroids. Um, that's what I want to talk about. Anabolic steroids increase your power in strength in power events. They are probably one of the first performance-enhancing drugs, 1950s, banned around the 1960s, 1970s, started to develop the tests, and now there's a very sophisticated testing system for picking up anabolic steroids. Um, so why have I started talking with blood transfusions, EPO, and anabolic steroids? First, there's really two reasons. Um, I would say, you know, scientists disagree about a lot of things, but I would say it would be hard to find a scientist who didn't think that a blood transfusion would improve a long-distance event. Um, and it's hard to find a scientist who wouldn't think that anabolic steroids, especially in female athletes, would not be performance-enhancing. And equally, those two kinds of drugs have the potential to be harmful to your health. So they hit that, that area. So we can talk about what that means, but that's, they, they hit that, that, that area. Um, I would say that different people are limited by different things in sport. 
So if you created a sport where these things were, were fine, and you may talk about that later on, that there's no problem with them, you would probably get a different winner than from a sport where those weren't available, because different people are limited by different things in sport. So there wouldn't be, in a sense, it wouldn't be the same, the same sport. So those are, I guess, clear-cut situations. I'm now going to pop down to the pharmacist um, and pick up this, which is a Boots Sudafed. Other brands are available. It's a decongestant. Um, use it for your money. Knows I use it frequently. I get lots of colds and coughs. Um, it's an alpha blocker, our alpha agonist, um, and it's a stimulant, and it increases your heart rate, and potentially, therefore, has a performance-enhancing um, effect. It was banned in sport, and then it was unbanned in sport for a while, and then when people realised, doctors realised it was being used more, it was banned again. So it gives you another example of what happens in sport. Does it, is it performance enhancing? Well, I've done a detailed analysis recently about the literature. And if there is an effect, it's very small. Um, is it bad for your health? Probably not. Um, but there you are. But that's an example of something that is currently banned in sport. Different kind of com compound. Um, another compound that's relevant, and all on the same sort of lines. Again, I didn't bother to go. And it's actually quite a bit harder to get now than it used to be. Not that I tried to get it before. That's meldonium. It's got a picture of Maria here. Um, so this is a drug that is probably increases blood flow um, in sport. Clearly, a similar thing. It wasn't banned. It was monitored. It was clear that it was massively being used by athletes where it was readily available in, in Eastern Europe, and it was banned. And you'll know from the, you'll look, follow the news what happened after that. Um, does it work? Does it have an effect? Um, I would say there's very little scientific literature out there at all. There's a feasible mechanism why it would have a performance enhancing effect. However, it's entirely possible that coaches and scientists have used it on their elite athletes and have checked what the effect is there. But we as an academic from the outside don't know. So there's a lot of hidden data. So we get another difficult field to get into if you're a scientist because there may well be a reason. Sometimes coaches, if one coach uses something, everyone else uses it, even if it's not necessarily performance enhancing. Um, there's a sort of a, a herd mentality with coaching. It's not quite a science, a bit of an art. But we don't really know. Is it harmful? It's a medicine, it's not clear. There are defined, defined doses. Um, probably not that harmful if used, as it says, on the tin. So those two have given examples of things that are less performance enhancing, probably, and it's less clear what the health issues are. So just to give you a sort of scientific background to where to you're going. And finally, I'm going to end up with another performance enhancing drug. Here we are, here. Um, this is a major Olympic sponsor. Other carbonated beverages are available. Um, this is obviously Coca-Cola, and the caffeine in here is undoubtedly a performance enhancing, it's definitely a drug, and it's undoubtedly performance enhancing. Loads and loads of studies on it, because we can do it, put it in sports science students ethically. So tons and tons of work on it, and work on it with elite athletes. Um, probably very limited health problems taking caffeine, um, though there is always a concern when people start taking a drug like caffeine, as opposed to in Coke or in a cappuccino, or an espresso, taking it in a pill. And occasionally, antidoping agents get concerned, and then they think, it's a pill. It must be bad for you. So there is an issue around caffeine. And of course, it was, no, of course, it was banned for a while, and it's not been banned. So it's unbanned. So performance enhancing drug banned, unbanned, probably no health benefits. There's a whole range of the issues around things. Um, I won't have time to go into the science of detection, but we scientists are clever people. Well, not me, other people are. And everything is detectable, right? No, the problem is some things are difficult to detect and difficult to create a test that is fair and will not catch people who haven't been cheating in, in, in the net. But in principle, it's all possible. But there is a lot less money in sport than people think compared to in medicine and healthcare, so it's difficult. Um, but it's all possible, I suppose. I'm just going to end, end with talking briefly about cheating. Um, what is cheating? I take a very pragmatic and simple view of this. Um, not, it's not, this is not really a science thing, it's just a simple view, is that there are rules, they're published, if you break the rules, you're cheating, okay? That's very simple. Um, and it helps me understand what, what's going on. And the question then, of course, is, is why are the punishments so extreme? They are extreme. So I'm gonna give an example of outright cheating. I was watching the France and Republic of Ireland match um, on, at the football, and I was wanting Ireland to win. For two reasons. One, it was against France, but that's perhaps my prejudice. But secondly, um, because I remember well Thierry Henry handling the ball and stopping Ireland by blatant cheating, stopping Ireland getting into a, a tournament. Not only did that cheating affect dramatically the sporting event, more so than doping probably, 
but it also went unpunished. Everyone saw it completely unpunished. Um, it also had economic impacts in, in the Irish economy. So this is a big bit of cheating, completely unpunished and um, really unrepentant. And um, if, you, if you look around here, about, about a couple of miles away from here, you'll find a statue of Tiamu Ori outside the Emirates Stadium. And an even worse, in effect, if you hate cheats, um, there was a joke, jovial discussion between Alan Shearer, Gary Lineker, and Thierry Henry uh, during the France Ireland game, saying, joking really about his, his cheating. So why is that not? Why is Thierry Henry a hero still, and Justin Gatlin an anti-hero, evil? I mean, I think you can you can probably address that more. Than me, there are I, there are two reasons I can think of, um, and the simple reason, the one that is, is straightforward to understand, is that doping is hidden cheating. So. In that sense, it cheats both the spectator and the rival competitor. You don't know someone's cheating. So you know Thierry, what Thierry Henry's, Henry's done. Um, and you know if someone dives in football, you think you know. And you can see that. And it's a light part of the sport. You could have a villain and you can see them. You don't know it's open. So there is a genuine, what you're seeing is, is, is not what you expect to see. And that's why the only other area where there are similar calls for life bans, and where there are life bans sometimes, is match fixing. Because again, the event is not what you see. So that's the simple reason why there are long, longer bands. There is a more complex reason, which I won't have time to go into when we should talk about. And that is, it's tied in to society's view of drugs as being bad, and that sportsmen are role models of a healthy and natural lifestyle. And therefore, um, you know, you know they, they should be seen to be to be not using these these things called called drugs. And I guess, I guess the apio, apio, I can't even say that. The apotheosis of that <laughs> is the UK anti-doping's 100% me campaign. So that's it's important. This is pure. This is natural. And that's another reason, in my opinion, but we can debate that, why doping is seen as being, as being exceptionally bad. And that, I think I will, I will leave it. No, I, think, I think it's really interesting. And also, I suppose, this is something else we can maybe come on to the second half, but kind of the fact that a lot of elite athletes, they take all sorts of supplements certainly, certainly orally, but also take lots of injections and, and all sorts, which are obviously legal, aren't banned, um, and yet sort of, again, go against that idea slightly of, you know, kind of this is a healthy, natural... Sport. Well, elite sport is not... I mean, so physical activity is really, really good for you, right? So any kind of physical activity is really good for you. I wouldn't say elite sport is no, healthy. Elite rugby is not healthy for your head. So I think that's... That, but that, but, so, there is, so the healthy argument is a, is a complicated one. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Sorry, Excellent, we'll come back to all that, um, but for now, over to you, Andy. Okay, um, thanks, Owen. Um, so the British Library said this was an informal event. This feels quite formal. <laughs> 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 uh, FYI. Um, but I, I thought I would do something I don't tend to do, which is talk a bit about my entry point into this world and what's happened over the 15 years or so that I have been within it. And, um, and in so doing, hopefully give you a sense of, of how I arrive at my position, which... I guess about uh, eight years ago, around just before the Beijing Games, uh, Nature published an article which quoted me as arguing on behalf of a world pro-doping agency. Uh, not one of those situations where I can claim they misquoted me, by the way. But, um, but the point at which I arrived at this, this proposition that we need a world pro-doping agency uh, came out of my entry point into the subject. So I did an undergraduate degree in sports science within which we had one of the few degrees in the UK that had a lot in philosophy and ethics and sociology. And all of those subjects informed my approach to sport. Uh, had very good friends that were elite athletes, uh, working on trying to improve their performances using technology, and spent the end part of my degree thinking about the technological continuum that operates within sports. Um, that led into a PhD. And bear in mind, this is about 1996. The cloning of Dolly the sheep was happening. The Human Genome Project was getting up some pace. And by the time I started my PhD and started working with the British Olympic Association and other organizations, um, there was already a sense in which our perception and the reality of what was possible in terms of performance enhancement was on the verge of changing dramatically. Uh, one of the first articles I read on the subject of gene doping was uh, an article by Andy Coglin, for New Scientist, who published a piece talking about a performance gene. So I was fascinated by the possibility that this predicament that sports have faced for arguably forever, that some people use things to enhance their performances, um, was going to become exponentially more challenging. And informed by the kind of 
complexity of that ethical dilemma. So athletes in ancient Olympia rubbing their bodies in olive oil to protect it against dehydration or using weight to propel themselves further as they did a standing jump all seemed part of this continuum. And it didn't seem obvious to me that anti-doping had a mandate. Now, of course, over the last century, we have seen that mandate grow off the back of a broader political war on drugs, which, depending on which literature you read, will express that war in very different ways. On the one hand, it's about protecting young people in sports and protecting young people in society. On the other hand, it's about controlling a range of political discourses that allow people in positions of power to manage their, their, their assets, their, their resources, to govern more effectively. Now, at this time, around about 99, 2000, the International Olympic Committee was suddenly becoming aware of the possibility of using genetic technology for enhancing performance. In 2002, when, the, uh, when WADA had its first gene doping symposium, there were coaches standing up saying, sorry, there were scientists standing up saying that they were being contacted by athletes and coaches wanting to get them enrolled into their gene therapy programs with the possibility of enhancing their performances. At the same time, the United States President's Council on Bioethics had started and was debating the possibility that we are becoming a culture that is much more predisposed to body modification and human enhancement. The prospect of designer babies, the prospect of doing all kinds of things to tamper with their biology was becoming a reality. So it didn't seem clear to me, and it still doesn't seem clear to me, that sport has a mandate in this area. It is, of course, as, as Chris has mentioned, concerned about the protection of fair, fairness within sport, so this title, Fair Game. Yes, if we agree the rules, and those rules are broken, you're cheating and should be punished for it. I completely agree with that. The point where I have challenge is around what the rules should be in the first place. And I think they are widely off the mark with regard to doping. I don't think that athletes are best protected by anti-doping. I don't think the playing field is fairer by the existence of anti-doping. And I think that people are becoming much less concerned about many of these substances, um, or even don't even engage with them in any meaningful way. Um, back in 2006, I was involved with, informally, uh, one World Anti-Doping Agency inquiry into the use of hypoxic chambers. This was a technology, and is a technology, that allows you to simulate different densities of oxygen within the air. It's effectively replicating going to different altitudes and training, which can bring a performance enhancement. The World Anti-Doping Agency considered whether it should be banned or not. And at this point, you know, it's a bit like the caffeine uh, that Chris mentioned. At this point, there was a real sense in which people didn't know whether to see this as a bad thing or a good thing. And many of the athletes that were using this you know, couldn't see any problem with it whatsoever. Now, had hypoxic chambers been banned at that point, which was the proposition at the time, everyone then would have condemned their use, and we would have said how immoral they are, and we shouldn't use them, and so on. But they weren't, and people now use them and have no problem with it whatsoever. So the moral context of the anti-doping debate, in my mind, is completely arbitrary. And for that reason, we should do more to encourage the safe development of performance-enhancing technologies, whether it's drugs or something else, to allow athletes a more open culture of use, a more medically supervised culture of use, to avoid the situation where people are in, as we now know still, these incredibly vulnerable positions where they are abused by people around them and misled, and where we have this black market economy of, of substance trafficking that underpins the possibility of doping. So that Nature article, about eight years ago in which I made the claim for a world pro-doping agency was a positive case for trying to ensure that athletes are using the safest performance of performance enhancement, recognizing that there is no safe form of performance enhancement, but they can be more safe by monitoring their use. And uh, that, for me, is where we need to be in sports. And I think uh, it's where I'll close, but I think that's also where we will have a much fairer competition and avoid these situations where we no longer no, really, who's won any race that's taken place anywhere in the world. Thank you. I think it's interesting, and also I'm really interested as well in this, uh, something I've written about a bit, is this sort of line between marginal gains, which is this thing that's really celebrated in sport mm. at the moment, and we've lauded our British cycling team and so on for getting every inch of advantage within the rules, and where that blurs into um, 
things that may be outside the rules as they mm -hmm. currently stand. And that sort of plays into the same debate, I think, about kind of, you know, oh, where do we arbitrarily draw the line almost? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think, I think the, the, the obvious thing that maybe we come on to again in the second half that, that, that people would say against your argument is, you know, where then where does it stop? Where do you, you know, kind of, you know, do we end up with seven-year-old footballers being pumped full of drugs because you want the, uh, you want the, you want the best? Well, at the moment, we have a situation where young kids are already being tested for drugs in, in, in their sporting performances. So I think this is a symptom of the problem. It's, it's not, a, it's not a, a good situation to be in, but I think that at the moment, most athletes are ill-informed about the risks of doing most of what they're doing if they're doping. And, and that's, a, wor that's the wor a worse situation to be in. If we allowed them to be more informed, if there were conversations, and all we hear about is these kind of ways in which doctors will take advantage of athletes. And I think that's, mm. you know, that's a situation that really needs to change dramatically, and it's not being enabled by the current system. So from pro-doping to uh, anti-doping. <laughs> <laughs> come to you, come to, uh, good order here, I think, but yeah, you can give the uh, alternative sure case, that. presumably, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what an UK anti-doping does. Uh, we're charged by government, organisation charged by government, to protect clean sport and clean athletes. Uh, and we do that by enforcing and monitoring what's called the World Anti-Doping Code, a set of rules uh, which are adopted worldwide to ensure there's a harmonised approach to anti-doping. And I, I guess right from the start, our position at UK Anti-Doping is that doping in sport is fundamentally wrong, uh, as it is for anybody to help an athlete uh, in that regard as well. And the way we try and tackle the issue of doping in sport uh, is in a number of ways. The most obvious one, uh, by testing athletes in and out of competition uh, with no notice. And that enables us not only to detect those that are choosing to dope, but also to deter those who are thinking of doping or thinking that they are getting away with it. Our education plays a, a fundamental role in what we do. And our starting point is to deliver values-based education. Uh, because our premise is that you've got to get into an individual when they're really young to try and influence their values. We've all got values. They're all, all different. They're probably some some consistency amongst us, but we'll all have values which we've acquired from a very, very early age. And if we can try and instill some values in children about why doping and cheating generally in sport is wrong, then I think it gives anti-doping organisations like us a, a, a good start or a good platform. So we have education. We have things called the Athlete Biological Passport. We're able to store samples for up to 10 years. You, I'm sure some of you will have read recently about the fact that the International Olympic Committee went back and tested samples that they'd collected at uh, Beijing uh, and in Sochi and found a number of athletes who'd managed to evade uh, the, uh, the likes of, of, of organizations like us. Uh, they managed to, 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 to reveal positive tests and then we have things like intelligence and investigations, which helps us to utilize other tools, such as links with law enforcement, uh, to try and get to not just the doping athletes, but those around them, their entourage, um, whether that's a coach, whether that's a medic. Uh, we have, in fact, prosecuted a father um, in the past uh, because he played a fundamental role uh, in how he supported his daughter, who was a, an athlete at the time. And, and having heard Chris and, and Andy speak, for me, I, it's pretty simple. It boils down to, for me, sport is about watching the pleasure of sport. And it's watching people use their natural talent, um, using their athleticism, whether it's skill, whether it's human f feats of endurance or strength to achieve phenomenal results and outcomes. And I wonder how those of us who love sport and follow sport would feel if we open that door to say, you know what, you can take what you want. Take what you want, let it have any effect on you, and would we all rush to watch it? I, uh, I went to the hygienist not so long ago, 
Um, you can all admire me later. But, uh, and she, and she really, it was just a throwaway comment. She said, what do you do? I don't really like to talk about what I do. So I gave her a very abridged version of what I do. And she went, you know, I'm not sure I'm ever going to watch the Olympics again. Um, I mean, she doesn't know me. She's got no reason to, to voice that, that, that comment. I, I'm never going to watch the, the Olympics again. It just, I don't believe in the performances that I'm seeing. She said, There's, you hear so much scandal, so much cynicism. She just said, I, I just, I'm not sure I ever want to watch it again. And I just thought that was a really sad indictment um, of where sport might have got to. Um, in terms of what's prohibited in sport, uh, when the World Anti-Doping Agency, on an annual basis, produce what's called the prohibited list, what goes on the list uh, is determined by fulfilling two out of three criteria, uh, whether it's performance enhancing, whether it's contrary to the spirit of sport, or it's detrimental to health. And they have a list expert group. So every year they come together, a group of experts, worldwide experts come together. Anti-doping organizations like ourselves are able to feed into the process. And then it gets signed off by, uh, an, I think it's a health, uh, ethics, and something else committee. Um, but there is a process. Um, and you're right, Chris, uh, Chris is absolutely right. Things go on and off the list, depending on the research and what uh, they as an organisation are seeing become very prevalent within the world of sport. Uh, I was asked to, to mention how big an issue I think this is in sport, and I just have no idea. Statistically, it's about 2%, which isn't very much at all. But that's a worldwide average statistic. And you have got to remember that there are countries out there which don't have organisations like UK Anti-Doping. They aren't as well resourced as us. Uh, they don't have, I guess, the longevity of experience that we do. And the, the, when you break it down into the, uh, the number of, of, of positive tests or anti-doping rule violations there are around the world, yeah, you do get into certainly some countries having a far greater or higher rate than some other countries do. Um, I think what we're seeing is that, unfortunately, the, the world that we live in, the societal world we're living in, is seeing steroid use at younger levels within sport. And that's because, I would say, particularly in, in young boys, they're seeing steroid use as a means by which they can acquire the body beautiful. You know, for so long we used to hear about women and whether it's anorexia or bulimia or women fighting for the body beautiful. I think we've all forgotten there's um, men out there, boys, and they also are fighting for the body beautiful. They're looking for a washboard stomach. They're looking for quick gains. They're looking to look good, and, you know, in front of whatever gender they're attracted to. Um, and so we're seeing that, and it's filtering down into amateur levels of sport as well, and that's because they don't think they're going to get caught, they don't think the rules apply to them, they don't think they're going to be tested. And you just have to pick up a paper, and one minute it's high-protein diet, then it's like no carbs, then it's no wheat, and you just go into any Holland and Barrett, any gym, and it's supplement, 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 and nobody knows what's in them really. I mean, I, you know, I would ask any of you, put your hands up, if you, have, if you work out at the gym and you take a supplement, you take a shake or a, some sort of additional supplement. And if you do, whether you check it out, whether you do due diligence to see whether you really know that what's in that product is what's in that product. Because often we're testing them and no way. They're contaminated. Um, and, and they're not actually serving you any benefit. Um, so this isn't just about the elite end of sport. This is about sport in entirety and how it feels it can gain an advantage, whether it's because they want to win some prize money, win in terms of medal or, 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 or podium placing, whether it's to win a contract, make it onto a team. There are all sorts of motivations. 
Um, but fundamentally, as, as both these gentlemen have said, anti-doping rules are just a facet of the rules to a sport. Um, and I do, I think it would be a grave shame if we open the door to, to let people take what they want. Uh, and then, as you say, on your, on your cynicism point, I mean, I think it's interesting, I went to the World Athletics Championships in China last year, and that was just the point at which not only had the ruling body for the sport been accused of huge corruption and covering up dope tests and all the rest of it, but there was also new evidence of the, 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 the sort of extent of doping within that sport, and it felt like those two things together just did create this sort of perfect storm of cynicism where people are literally sitting there and think, and the moment they say, I'm not sure I can believe this in any sense, is when I think psychologically they start to turn off. But I do think it's also more complicated than that because you've got a sport like football, which for all that FIFA is a kind of, you know, a, a cesspit of kind of corruption, is still the world's most popular and uh, biggest commercial sport. And kind of, I think people just have a different attitude to, to doping within it. I mean, kind of, you know, we all know there probably is a problem there, and yet the kind of the, the appetite to find out, and actually the appetite on behalf of the public to, to get to the bottom of it doesn't seem to be in there in the same way as it is for, for other sports. So I think it's, it's sort of, I'm slightly agreeing with both of you here, but, you know, kind of the, um, I do think that there's, there's something to be said for the, for, the, for the argument that, you know, we can't always be completely black and white and prescriptive about what, you know, what it means to... What it, what, what it will do to people's faith in sport in each individual sport. But there's no doubt that for a lot of people, if they can't believe what is in front of their eyes, then it ceases to, to matter as a, as a spectacle, I think. Well, wrestling does OK. I mean, it, it is, is about... It, is, is wrestling a sport? Well, is, well, is, is, is WWF it, a sport? Is, is or is it the, entertainment? I, mean, I think that there is a point at which elite sports are very much about spectacle and entertainment mm. and suspense and drama and the thrill. I'm, I'm not sure I agree that... We watch sports for the joy of it. I mean, my son, six year old, playing sport, I watch him for the joy of it, and I you know, get much out of that. And there is a certain sense of, of that aspiration for modern sports still within, I think, contemporary life, but it's a long time since sports have been that kind of thing. They are incredibly serious, incredibly political, incredibly imbued with finance. And I think that you know, most athletes would reject the idea that what they're doing is playful or even you know, about just fun and enjoyment. It, but it again, where's the line? If your son was picked up by a Premier League academy and all of a sudden it becomes very serious at seven, eight... And yeah, which, you know, again, this is where sports federations need to challenge this. I mean, one example, five, ten years ago nearly, uh, the world's first genetic test for an athletic gene came out. Complete nonsense scientifically. But at the time, you know, there was a brochure, I've still got the brochure, uh, which allows you to take a mouth swab from your child and detect whether they're more likely to be power-based or endurance-based athletes. This was um, $100 on the internet, of course. Um, but at the time, um, various sports uh, organizations were thinking about using this as a basis for talent identification. Now, the kids on this brochure were about eight or nine years old. And that particular test and the wider debate about whether gene IDs should be used as a basis of selection led to WADA making its Stockholm declaration that said, we shouldn't allow this. We shouldn't allow anyone to use genetic tests for talent ID. But we remain in the situation where, by the way, they also argued that kids shouldn't specialize before the age of 10. And yet we are within this culture of encouraging kids into competition at the age, you know, kids in Ethan's class, like six years old, are in their training academies already. So I think that the world of sport needs to push back on this in a much stronger way. Uh, if it's really committed to these ideas, then it needs to push back much further. It doesn't. Why not? You know, because I don't think there is a serious anxiety about that, that, you know, that is born, in, born out in terms of policy, but also in terms of funding. As Chris said, the funding underpinning anti-doping is just a, a drop in the ocean. Can I just pick up your question about, mm. your, about football, where you think people don't really care? <laughs> That's because there hasn't really been a big doping mm. scandal in football. I think it's best to look across the, across the pond, not the European pond, because we don't talk about Europe anymore, but across the US You win pond. the prize, you win the prize. I uh, win the prize, the first one, yes. <laughs> what was the work? Amer American football, baseball. So, no, equal. baseball. <laughs> so, 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 no, but look at baseball. American football, let's not talk about American football, but baseball. The Major League Baseball has clearly had a doping, major doping mm. scandal, and there was a perception that actually the fans just wanted to see the home runs, um, and didn't really care how, how, the, mm. how the sausages were made, how they looked, you know, in the old, in the old joke. But actually, it, uh, what's happened is there's been a change, and I've been interested in Andy's opinion about this, where the fans did start to revolt against this, mm. in a sense, and certainly the organisation did, and now, even if it's not part of the world, now it's got a very aggressive 
yeah. and anti-doping, in part, I think, driven by the people revolting against this. So I, I think a similar thing might happen in football. I, I, and, it, and it was an interesting question, because I thought for a while Major League Baseball would be exactly the kind of Andy's, mm. Andy's book. Well, they didn't really care, because the there was a clear spectacle difference, number of home runs. So you could clearly see it was, it was part mm -hmm. of the power game. And it has been a bit of a, a move back. And I don't know what the sociology reason for that is, mm. but I, I, I suspect if people saw spectacular things going on in football that needed drugs, what would happen? And I don't, I don't think that's an interesting point. It's clear I, cut, isn't it? I and suppose I think it's part is. of the problem. And the NFL is the other side of the club where it is very much still seems feels going, like it's not going to the NFL. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's a separate issue. Hmm. Um, I mean, I, you know, I'm not an expert on baseball. I would say that baseball is much more part of the. Um, the political economy of, of America and, and the American elite than perhaps football is here. I think that it's a, you know, so, so the point is that baseball became part of that wider political war, which, you know, you think about Barry Bonds, all these people became part of a wider discourse that I don't think here really happens. You know, if a, if well, a British baseball person- Baseball is the US equivalent to cricket, so it does have this thing that it should be fair, I suspect, that may be where, it, where it's yeah. come about, but I, 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 mean, I don't know. You both, and you both said that, you know, anti-doping funding is a, is a drop in the ocean, and that's certainly true. I mean, kind of, you know, if you look at the huge amounts of money in, in sport and the amount that's given to, that, that both sport itself and, and government give to, uh, to WADA, which is the international, anti-doping agency, and then you can have the same argument on a national level with organisations like UCAL. I mean, it's clear to most people that they're woefully underfunded if you look at the scale of what, they're, what it is they're trying to do. If, if there was a lot more money, Nicole, do you think it would be a lot more effective in terms of catching people? For us, hmm. I have to say yes. Um, it's, not just enough, it's not about just throwing money at it money at it and it's not just about testing anymore we've so moved on from where we were 10 years ago um, because at, at the end of the day unless you're stupid and you get to court if you're intelligent and a doping athlete you, you'll be doing all sorts of things which require as chris said some really good science behind it um, to pick up the microdosing, um, and uh, there are 10 violations under the World Anti-Doping Code. Three of them relate to testing. You can't, as an organization, sit there and go, right, we're just going to test and educate. This is about the trafficking, the aiding, the betting, the administration, getting to all of the people around an athlete. Yes, of course, there are some athletes who make that sole decision all by themselves to dope. But I can't for one minute think that they're, they are vast in number. Mm. They've got people around them, entourages. I think the wealthier the sport or the wealthier the athlete, the more likely there are a whole network of individuals helping them. And in some ways, part of the problem is historically the athletes tended to, to carry the cat and while yeah. the, the network moves on to... Yeah, I mean, I mean, at UK Anti-Doping, if you're talking about resources and diverting resources to where you think you'll get the best gain, if we had um, uh, some intelligence to say that there was a coach who coached a number of athletes administering or helping them to dope, we'll go after the coach rather than the athlete, for sure, every time, because that individual is having a far a greater detrimental impact than that, the one doping athlete. So mm -hmm. that's, yeah. Chris, you mentioned sort of slightly arbitrary nature of the, of the WADA Band list in a sense, in the, and, and so did you, Andy, yeah, in the sense that you know the, the oxygen ten exa example is a good one. Do you, I mean, do you, do you think that is the best way? Of, if we if we if we decide, if sport decides, this is something it wants to pursue. Is this the best way of? So there are lots it? of arbitrary rules in sport, and I, and I don't have a problem with WADA having to devise a rule somewhere. I, my, my rule would be a little bit different. I would probably wouldn't ban pseudoephedrine, mm. but this is in the in the noise of the of the debate. You might decide where where you go. So I don't think I think you know, if you're going to have a situation. You know, not the Andy, you know, not the Andy Beer situation. Where you're going to, then you have to have rules, and, and that has to be part of of the rules. And I think, so I think, I think there are issues. Though I do think I take we have had this debate for four years ago, probably con contention with Andy that if you let everything happen, what what would the sport look like? And I always go back to the sort of cheap argument, really, which say it would look like we've seen it. It looks like East Germany, and female sport would be fundamentally different. There is absolutely no doubt that if you, and then if you could not have that, because if they take anabolic steroids, they'll get bigger and they'll be faster. And they will dominate the sport, absolutely no doubt about that. So then you've got to say, okay, well, 
Should we just go up to a certain level of anabolic steroids? And then you have to have testing. And you cannot, as long as, it, as long as, if you have completely open, you will get female athletes who look like them, male, um, and because they are, uh, you know, not male, but they, yeah, they have, a, with all they the have health, all associated health risks. Risks. With associated health risks, because they win, they'll win. So if you believe in elite sport, and you believe that it doesn't matter how you do it, there is no doubt that, that will, they will win. And therefore, you have to say, for the health benefits, I would suggest if you do it, do it healthily, you'll have to dope less. Mm. And therefore, and, but then some people will try and dope more. And you have to create the rule. So you cannot do this. It has to be part of the rule um, if you want a sport that does not look like a sport like, like that. So I don't mind if you have a sport that looks like that, if that's what you want to see. But the rules are there in this life. I mean, it's like, but it is, it is, you do get t stuck into some of the same arguments about drugs and society. Mm. So do you make everything yeah, completely, yeah. and they're not completely linked, but actually there are, there are links in, that, in, that, in those arguments. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that, um, again, to go back to the first point I made was about the technological continuum within sports and the fact that modern, you know, modern sport is, uh, grew alongside the growth of the, the uh, emergence of sports science, which is in the business of performance enhancement. And I've met over this 15 years numerous people working with athletes who are allowing them to use forms of performance enhancement that are, I think, as, as worrisome to WADA as the things they ban, but they're not on the list. I mean, if you want to Google one, you can Google the glove from Stanford University, which is effectively a system that allows you to um, reduce your core body temperature uh, significantly, which of course is one of the big factors in fatigue and de de um, degradation of performance. If you can lower the core temperature, you can do much better. And this particular technology does that incredibly well. So there are a whole range of technologies that athletes can use that may be alternatives to the things that are currently banned. I think that synthetic substances generally are inherently problematic because they are not attuned to our biochemistry. They're not things that we can predict in terms of side effects. And so in some respects, for me, the, genom the genomic era was a way of making things that were more tailored to our own physiology. And, and that's where the investment should be. I think there's an obligation for the world of sports to invest into safe forms of performance enhancement and reduce these risks. Nick, I'll just probably break for, for a drink and then uh, bring all of you in. Um, can I just ask you, pick up on that, on that question again that Chris raised really around meldonium and, and Sudafed and so on, which is kind of, where, where's the line with things that do, can have a medical use, but clearly are not being used for medical reasons? I mean, if you read through the um, Maria Sharapova decision, you'll see that she was taking 30, 40 different medications at any one time, which can't possibly have been for uh, ailments, but clearly it must have had a performance enhancing effect. Is it clearly, it must be unethical to, to do that, but how do we necessarily police that? Because again, you're sort of, you're resting with jelly a little bit on it. Thanks for that question. <laughs> Just the light one before we break the <laughs> I think it is really difficult to please. I really do. Um, you know, when I, you hear arguments about somebody who wants to take something because, for example, somebody who's got a low testosterone level wanted to take testosterone to get themselves up to a level that is equivalent to, for example, Chris and Andy's level. Well, is that performance enhancing or is that just getting them up to a point where actually they are on a level playing field to compete with them? I, it, it, it's so difficult and I am so not a science person. Um, but I, I mean, clearly there are, the problem is that you've got a range of substances that benefit different athletes depending on what their sport, depending on what their discipline is. Um, and I remember when we were, I don't know if it was through a, a one of the iterations of the, the World Anti-Doping Code, or it was a prohibited list, and we were talking about EPO, and oh, I, it's the WADA technical document for sports-specific analysis, and this is a, a requirement on organizations like ourselves to do a minimum level of things like EPO, human growth hormone, um, insulin testing, etc., cetera, um, across certain sports, or within certain sports. And there was a discussion about whether EPO, you, you do not test for EPO in all sports. You just don't because you do not think, for example, that a table tennis player is going to be taking EPO. And there were some extraordinary responses from the international federations of, no, but our intelligence is telling us that EPO would be used. And so it, it's 
God knows what drives people to take this stuff. And I mean, I would take that if I thought I was going to lose some weight. Um, but some, to somebody else, it might be that it might so be a stimulant. Sudafed doesn't make you lose weight, just in case anyone in the audience is thinking it does. Or to somebody else, it might be a diuretic. You know, everybody's yeah. motivation behind taking something is completely different. But you so. also get the slightly chicken and eggs now, don't, don't you, where, um, again, you know, I'm no scientist, but in among long distance runners, there's higher prevalence of, uh, of asthma or, mm. or thyroid mm. complaints, and it gets a bit chicken yeah. and egg about whether they're, you know, kind of... Oh, yeah. And the, the, the the Sorry, yeah. there's no getting away from the, the, that. You have to get into the science. I mean, yeah. you can't, you know, you can't get away, and there will be difficult. I think go back to Andy's point. There is a, there is a continuum, but most things in life are a continuum. It doesn't mean you can't work out the extremes. Yeah. So, and, and the extremes could be wrong. So, and I, I, there is a feeling. I mean, I, I don't think I wrote it in my book that you know, anti-doping has got a thing against biochemists. It doesn't mind about physiologists. Doesn't mind so much about technologists. But it's got a thing against biochemists, and that's because it was historically come out with medics not liking drugs that should help people being used for sport. That's the historical reason, if you look into the, about why, the, and why the Mil, Mil, uh, Meldonium bit has, is, is highlights that, and actually in, indirectly the Sudafed as well, there are other reasons about Sudafed. Um, so there is an issue that they really don't like, something that is designed to um, get sick people better, be used to get better people um, yeah. even better. And it, that, and that may be a good reason, but that there is a cultural reason. That's why if you look at the doping list, that's why how it was how it was brought up. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, that, those are still the rules, but that's yeah. historically, um, and that, that get, feeds exactly into the um, hypoxic tent argument, which yeah. is not biochemistry. On the other hand, it's, mu it's very hard to do a hypoxic tent to raise your red blood cell levels enough to be remotely dangerous. So, yeah. the, so that's another reason why. Um, but you know, elite athletes do very difficult, weird things to their body. I mean, they're not healthy to what they do with the training. It's not like normal. There is this distinction, and, and I think Nicole was very clear about you know, normal health or physical activity you want to do. That's not elite sport at the top end. is not necessarily the normal healthy thing. Forgetting about drugs, it's, 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 it, you do strange things even in physiology. So it's a different different kettle of fish. I mean, just to bring it back to one thing Nicole said, um, doping in sport is fundamentally wrong. Um, Switch that word doping for something else. Cheating in sport is fundamentally wrong. Um, or look at the three ticks for WADA. Uh, performance enhancing in sport is fundamentally wrong. Probably not. Um, health, taking health risks in sport is fundamentally wrong. Probably not. Things that are against the spirit of, of sport are fundamentally wrong. Yeah, probably. <laughs> it's tautological, isn't it? But, uh, but what is that spirit of sport? I think it is a spirit that is about... Nurture. I mean, this came up in the hypoxic, the hypoxic chambers test in 2006 was the first occasion when the World Anti-Doping Agency's newly formed Ethical Issues Review Panel considered a case. They concluded that sport is about the virtuous perfection of natural talents, which, by the way, didn't win the argument to prohibit hypoxic chambers. But the point is that those, yeah. those virtues are not undermined by performance-enhancing drugs. In many respects, they can allow you to be more of an athlete by allowing you to train harder. That's what anabolic steroids allow you to do, is to recover faster, train harder, and achieve your gain on the basis of that. Um, uh, sorry, I've had this argument. Somebody else gave me this argument, and it's not right. It was Ellis Cashmere. It's not right. So okay. anabolic steroids don't just work by enabling you to train harder. So if I did nothing and took anabolic steroids, I would, get a, I would be more powerful, right? I, and certainly two females, it's true for males. Now, if I did that and trained, I would be much more powerful. So there's a synergistic effect. But, but, I just but that's why athletes just want to get the science. That's why athletes do. They do both. But they I just want to get down. this. Yes, but I just, it's not just, so Ellis said this, it's not just about, oh, yes, they make you train, train harder. The benefit is the pathways are synergistic. So there's a pathway that steroid fits into and a pathway that training fits into. So you do both, you get the double enhancement. But you, they don't ne enable you to train faster. So but there that, is a biochemist. Sometimes science, science is... Yeah, I mean, I accept that, but athletes are not taking them and sitting on their backsides no, doing clearly nothing. they're not. No, no, but they're not just <laughs> enabling them to train harder. Yeah. They, they are doing something else. Um, that's, that's, on that yeah. note, sorry. I'm going to blow, I'm gonna, I know, sorry, I'm gonna, that's me being, being, being sciencey. And, uh, we can, uh, we can <laughs> all get another drink, and uh, hopefully you've all thought of some fantastic questions during that first half, and uh, where we can lead in about five or ten minutes. Thank you very much. So please uh, feel free to uh, fire away. Uh, put your hand up and wait for um, one of the people with the mic to get to you. And if you just say uh, who you are and what you do and then who you'd like to ask your question of, and we'll uh, get underway. Yeah, there's one here. 
Uh, hi, just, um, just to introduce myself, I'm Neha. I'm a PhD student looking at performance enhancing drug use in the gym going population. I'm also a competitive powerlifter, so I'm kind of there on both sides of the coin, as it were. Um, just to uh, ask you just a quick question, Nicole. You said earlier, and I quote, would people rush to see doped sports? In my sport as a powerlifter, you get tested and untested federations. And I can tell you that untested federations, uh, or, not, or not only in powerlifting, also in strongman and also in bodybuilding, you know, people will rush to see those bodybuilders on stage. They get paid hundreds of thousands and millions and millions of dollars in endorsements every year, paid for by the gym going population. You know, people want to see, they don't want to see the average man on the street going up and doing something. When they see an elite athlete, they want to see somebody who's done everything they can to get to that stage. So. Um, I just wanted to see what your thoughts were on um, when you said that people don't want to see dope sport when it's clearly very, very popular in, for many people. So if, if you're talking about bodybuilding, um, is that what you're talking about, bodybuilding, um, powerlifting? Powerlifting, strongman and bodybuilding, but three sports. I mean, I guess bodybuilding generally has a bad history behind it because a lot of what you're seeing in terms of the physiques of the individual is can only have been attained through um, chemical means. Uh, what I will say is that some of the sports that you're talking about aren't compliant with the World Anti-Doping Code. And I think that speaks volumes because you've got some sports who are clearly saying, I have no wish to be recognized as a code compliant sport. Bodybuilding isn't. No, no, bodybuilding isn't. Um, but well, I said some of the sports. Yeah. I didn't say all of the sports. I said some of the sports. Um, I think any sport that is compliant, well, then my message to them is, well, I, I hear what you're saying, that people are rushing to, to see doping in those, that, in those sports. But if they're compliant with the World Anti-Doping Code, they are therefore open to being tested, and they are also open to being found to be breaching the rules and to be caught and sanctioned. So, um, yeah, I mean, you're right. Some people might ru rush to watch sports where there's doping. But my question to you, or my response to you, would, would be that those sports who take it seriously will have a, uh, a position on it mm. and will take it seriously and sanction those who choose to do it. So, read into that what you will. Is there not also a sort of slightly wider question, though? Again, and again, it's one we've talked a lot about in, in recent years, which is that sort of clash between the commercial considerations of a sport and its, and its um, determination to catch dopers because, you know, kind of inevitably people want to see records broken and they want to see someone climb the Von too fast than they did last year. They want, so even though there might not be a direct, um, you know, mandate to, to dope your athletes, actually by, by, by emission you're, you're guilty of doing the same thing. Do you think that's changing or do you think that's still... Yeah, I think so. I think it's particularly in the light of things like the scandal within athletics. Um, I think sponsors as well are picking up on the fact that maybe these are sports where they want to see some kind of commitment from um, the, 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 the International Federation or the governing bodies to anti-doping. I think sponsors have been pretty quiet to date, but I mean, if you're a big sponsor of an event and you have a major crisis, it's not looking particularly good for you as a sponsor. So mm. I think things, I think a couple of the, the crises that we've seen within sport are definitely moving the tide. Um, on a slightly different tack, I'm Jackie Johnston uh, from British Rowing. Um, you've talked about the history of doping, and you've talked about what we're seeing in doping uh, at the moment. What about the future? Do you have a vision of what the trends in doping look like? Because can we get ahead of the game? If we know what it's starting to move into, uh, then we can sort of work more intelligently to prevent it from happening. Let's come to the scientists Andy. Andy's the one who seems to think scientists can do everything. I love this idea about this, this perfect, perfect gene doping that will work, and we can't even get gene therapy to work. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we can just about. So I think, I think, um, uh, so I think there is, I think there are ways of enhancing sport. Um, I think so. The, the big thing is, it was ten years ago, fifteen years ago, was when Andy was, was gene was gene doping. Let, let's do gene doping, and that will create this big difference. And the reality is, it, it's very difficult to do and to get it to work. So I think that, that became a big issue. Um, it wasn't really practical at that time. Could still be more practical now. So, and what surprised me, actually, in terms of the 
history is how Russia situation, let's take on a number of hours, and how, how much it was back to the future. I mean, the doping that they, yes, they had, what they were doing was KGB basically infiltrating and cheating the whole system in the first place, so you don't get caught. And you have ath women athletes taking anabolic steroids, and men athletes, male athletes, and women athletes doing blood boosting. And, that, and they're effective. So in that sense, we know, we know in, that, in sport what's effective. We know in rowing what would work. Um, and if you're clever, it's very difficult to detect it. So why bother going to that? Uh, my view would be that we're a long way away, away from even the current situation. So I think, I think there are ways forward. I mean, I think Andy's got this. I, I like Andy's idea about there are other whole areas, you know, this technology and doping. And there are obviously the motorized bikes, which I think is slight, a bit of a side issue. You, you so mean I, motorbikes? <laughs> yeah, or not motorbikes, depending on what they are. So I think there is conceivable, and it, and it really depends a little, a little bit. And so I do agree with some things I've heard Andy say before about if society accepts gene doping. So it might well be that if you can get a gene doping that will enable you to see better or to do something, in the, and when it becomes like Botox, then there will be a move towards those things happening in sport, and it will be hard to then have sport where people are less good. Um, so I think there's, but it's cult, so it's tied in with, with culture, the, where the future goes. And, but you're asking, asking about how do you get, a, get ahead of the, of the game, and that really, a lot of that is in, about intelligence, not about science. It's about knowing what people are, people might might be doing, and then it's noticeable that you know, as Nicole says, that a lot of UK antidoping is not about what you, you think. It's about just doing drug tests, and it's a lot about even more about intelligence than about, than about that. So she's probably better to answer this question than I am because she knows what people are trying to do, and I. I just guess from the sidelines. And they sort of gene doping. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I think this actually relates to the previous question a bit as well, because in order to answer the question, you have to step back and think about what sports will look like in 30 years from now, what sorts of things people will be doing. Uh, we had a little conversation about esports earlier. We can come to that if you like. But the, you know, my view is that if the Olympic Games was created today, Women and men would compete alongside each other. Olympic and Paralympic would compete alongside each other. And you only have to look at what's happened in, from 2012 to 2016 with the inclusion of Paralympians with prosthetic limbs. 2012, Oscar Pistorius, who we don't talk about much anymore, was part of the Olympic Games, the first athlete with a prosthetic limb to take part in the Games. Not terribly competitive. Four years later, we have Marcus Rim, who's vying to compete as a long jumper at the Rio Olympic Games and is a medal contender. So athletes with arguably bionic limbs or prosthetic limbs are becoming more capable than those with biological limbs. After 2012, we saw an incredible turnaround in terms of the attention to the Paralympic Games. Remarkable. And I think that with the growth of this, we would see an increase in that and an interest in that kind of sport and a, and a loss of interest in what we currently see as Olympic sport. But they will migrate, they will converge and become uh, objects of fascination in the way that I think the previous question alluded to, that our interest in what is elite and extraordinary underpins elite sports. I think it's a red herring. I, I'm, I'm sorry. So we, know, we already know wheelchair athletes beat normal athletes in the marathon, right? So we know that. So, and the Oscar Pistorius thing, with the whole debate about Oscar Pistorius and, and about legacy, will be, does this limb put you on exactly the same playing fields. Mm. It's not about, if, we, if it's going to be better, then it's a different kind of sport. It's the motorbike, and that's completely fine. It's just a different sport. So I don't buy that you can throw all this together. It's just slightly um, about the testosterone argument as well. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, yeah. well, of course, it is the same about the, the yeah. women and testosterone argument, natural mm. testosterone. I mean, my point wasn't about comparing performances. My point was that public fascination for prosthetically enhanced performances oh, sure. will grow significantly, and the Olympics may find itself trying to catch up. But then if you look at what's happened to Paralympic but, sports since 2012, there was this great flowering of interest, but that's, has that been sustained? Well, it's not been, the, the investment's not been there. That goes back to my point about women in sport. Let's face it, you know, the investment just isn't there to enable the level of interest that, that would underpin that kind of investment. I mean, that's you know, the historical reason for why each of these communities, groupings, doesn't attract the same level of attention is to do with investment into the sports. It's plain and simple. It's not about it's not biological right. capability. I mean, you see oh, a... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Can, can I ask? Yeah, yeah, please. I feel like please. I'm a science question, right? So, so, so there are biological differences between males and females that will implement <laughs> effect. And, and there are cultural, massive cultural differences, but it doesn't matter how much... Because we have societies... Again, I would look at East Germany. Even the East German doped female athletes, where there was massive cultural phenomenon... In fact, they had more female athletes than males because they knew they could enhance them better with drugs, wouldn't beat their male athletes. So... 
it's not, you have to be careful about, sometimes you can't break the rules of science or break the rules, you know, so, so females and, you know, it's not just a cultural reason why males are faster than females. It's a biological reason. No, it's a cultural reason. reason as to why they're separated historically. Sports can be arranged in all kinds of ways. Sure, but... In many sports, men and women so do we, compete alongside yeah. each other. So there are ways in which sport can right. adapt to accommodate the values of the society that it interests. That's, That's clearly the I'm case. They can do. It will be a very, very different... OK, so you're talking about a very, very different kind of sport. Well, a different well, value be, system. But it won't be it. how fast can you run 100 metres? No. Well, it might not be, no. It might not be. No, in fact, that's not, and that's not been around for very long either, let's face no, it. No, no, I have no problem with it being a big... <laughs> talk and change and that, I have no yeah. problem. People, people, trying, to, people trying to run faster than one has been long around for an awful time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. But, <laughs> but in order to answer your question, you need to know what sport will look like, and I think those things are fundamentally possible to disturb, and, and I think there's, there's will to do that. Nicole, from, a, from, a, from an anti-doping point of view, I mean, we hear a lot about this sort of arms race, as though there's people in labs now who are creating new things that are going to sort of outwit the testers. Is that a sort of realistic portrayal, or is it more to Chris's point that basically, you know, it is the same old techniques, you just have to become better at, they just be more clever at using them? Yeah, but I, I think Chris said earlier that the, the way that this all originated, the prohibited list, was because you have pharmaceutical companies producing products which are for the treatment of therapeutic um, condition, or for, for genuine conditions, um, and then people manipulate them and abuse them to gain an unfair advantage over and above for the purposes for which they were, they were brought into the market. And so uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency has made this big deal about uh, collaborating with the pharmaceutical industry Say, look, you know, if you're bringing a new product onto the market, give us the heads up, help us to understand what it could be used for, what, if it, what its composition is, and whether somebody could use it to gain an unfair advantage. Um, so there's that. Uh, oh, and a there's particular sort of subject. I mean, human growth hormones seems to be a thing for a while, and then, you know, kind of, there's all, is there yeah, anything just, coming down the track that you're particularly worried about? Uh, no, I mean, I, I mean, just generally, I think we're always worried about the, the ability to. Uh, engineer or, or change the composition of something. Um, and, I, I, I mean, if you look at somebody like Dwayne Chambers, the whole reason he was caught in the first place was because somebody gave a vial to uh, the laboratory in America to say, look, you know, there's something in here. I think you guys need to be having a look at it. They looked at it, went, hmm, did some tests, and, and there was born a, a test for THG. So it just, we are reliant on individuals out there in the sporting community and beyond to feed us the intelligence that helps us to identify where that next threat might be. More questions? One at the back. This is a question for Dr. Mia. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a law student, and um, earlier you made um, a very impressive sociological and philosophical argument <clears throat> about drug taking. Um, basically, what I wanted to say, um, if, for example, someone is already born with a certain gene, and you do not possess that gene, but both of you take the same drug, I'm, the person who, who is born with the more superior gene will still be, um, let's say, more faster than the person that has got a slower gene by birth. So that kills that argument. And the only way for that person to then be on the same level playing field, they would have to cheat. So they would have to get a drug that is better than that drug that that person is using. My second question to you, Dr. Mia, is <clears throat> um, do you think your argument is unbalanced and dangerous, considering there are lots of videos on YouTube of people dying from the abuse of steroids use? Two questions. <laughs> <laughs> So to the first question, there would still be this imbalance. That's your concern, is that despite having this rule that allows people to use it, the inherent or the presumed inherent genetic predisposition leads still to this unfair or un unlevel playing field. Is that, that your point? Um, I think that uh, the response to that is to think about a range of performance enhancers, not just the drug. 
and to recognize that the science of what makes something works best for you may be different from what works best for somebody else. Um, you know, let's take altitude training, for example. You might be perfectly optimized for your sport by using a hypoxic chamber. That might be the best way to get the performance enhancement for you. The person next to you may get the best out of themselves by going to a mountain and, and running within that environment. So I think there is much more variance in what allows any given performance enhancement to be optimal for any specific athlete. And the position is to allow athletes to use a range of these things and discover what works best for them. And the science behind most of those is, I, th I think, more nuanced than just you know, one hit for everybody that takes it. it, it, it and I think the, the advantage that you would get in a situation where your peers are all doing it as well is in that science that underpins it, related specifically to both your, your own particular circumstances and, and what makes you run faster. The, uh, the argument about, um, is it a dangerous position? Jeez, I mean, videos online and encouraging certain behaviors. I mean, my, my concern about the anti-doping situation today, I mean, those videos are within the context of the present system. Um, would, would athletes be safer? I mean, the question is, is whether, they, whether they would be safer in the system I describe. I think they would. Uh, because I think you would have medical professionals giving more meaningful, useful advice about those risks associated with enhancements and uh, allowing athletes to take responsibility for those risks. But without any monitoring, you have those lethal consequences to those videos perhaps that you described. So I think that it's not irresponsible. I think the present system's irresponsible. I don't think it protects the health of athletes and I don't think it protects the level playing field. Is that even the case? I mean, kind of, sorry to keep bringing the kids into this, but you know, kind of, is that even the case of sort of 14, 15 year old, years old? Is it, you know, do you, would you have like, you know, what sports scientists coming in and say, here's the best way for you to inject steroids and to kind of make well, sure... Well, you may not need to do that. That's the point. Right. I mean, that's where the World Pro Doping Agency is in the business of supporting safer forms of performance enhancement. And at the moment, the situation is that athletes do things behind closed doors and take additional risks because of that culture of secrecy. I think that's a, a suboptimal system. There is no completely safe system. You know, I completely accept that. But I think the present system, which is behind closed doors, illegally trafficked drugs, which is 99% you know, of the ones that athletes use, that's got to be a worse situation. I would rather my son, when he enters elite sport, if he chooses to do so, was in a system where he can make informed choices about what he's doing rather than just be encouraged by people that want to exploit him and whom he trusts. Would you, would you agree that cigarette is heavily regulated? Mm -hmm. However, we still have thousands of people dying every year from cigarettes. Yes. And your point? My point is, even if you should have monitoring of the, uh, the steroids or the, any enhancing drug that is used, people, still take people will still take risk yeah, and people will still abuse it. Absolutely, absolutely. But the point is that you know, the, the, the present system undermines your ability to make an informed choice. The system I describe enhances that. And yes, people still take risks. Sports are inherently about risk taking. And people say that well, there's the risks of rugby, of you know, tackling somebody and the possible injury you may suffer is a relevant risk because it's part of the sport and what makes it possible, whereas drugs detract from that. They aren't essential to the skills of the sport. But I think that, again, if you look at this uh, from the perspective of the, of the safety of the athlete, the health of the athlete, the situation they're in at the moment is where they are unable to make informed choices about those risks so, associated with doping. It so just isn't possible. So I should say, the way, the way Andy is going in response to your question, the way you're asking it, is very much about drugs in society, yeah. not so much about drugs in sport. So there's a whole similar argument that we should, if we're going to legalise you know, drugs in society, then people will know they're taking the right thing, then their doctor will talk about it. So it is essentially the same argument. I'm not against that argument, but that is... The argument, uh, I think that's that's a good argument to have. I think doctors, I think if you have people who are go to their doctors, I mean, I, we don't have medic. Well, on the, on the panel, we don't have anyone who's medically qualified. If someone came to a GP saying a bodybuilder saying they were doing the these drugs, GP wouldn't say just don't do it. They would talk to them about it and they would work out. Well, I don't know. You see no more than I do. Okay, good. You know more than I do. It's excellent. <laughs> but I mean, they would maybe they wouldn't engage. They would just say no. Okay, they don't, they don't engage and try and, because um, it, clearly it's an issue, so it's all done out, so it is all done underground. Yeah, I, because, it, it, because amongst, amongst the medical community, there's background doctors, so... Yeah. I mean, like, this is yeah it's, no, it's, no, it's so, good. There's a mic coming your way. Yeah, so it's really good to you, someone... Know. 
Um, so kind of have insight on this as well. Um, with regards to medical education on AAS, because AAS use is increasing every year. You know, I recently went to a conference in Liverpool about this. It is increasing every year and the age range is getting younger, you know, so it is, it is a worrying trend in that regard. Um, but I don't think there's, I get so many stories like, you know, because I, inter I have to interview people as part of my research. I get stories saying I'm not comfortable going to my doctor because all they do is tell me not to do it. You know, they just shame okay. me for my choices, this, that. And that kind of discourages people from getting the appropriate help, I think, which is kind of, okay. I think. So yeah. my issue with AAS um, is, is not the short term side effects, which I actually think some of the bodybuilders are better at knowing what, how to deal with them than the doctors, but it's the so longer, it's, it's the long, so and, and, androgenic anabolic steroids, so, the, you know, so sorry. Um, so the, it's the longer term, and which is it's unknown really in terms of liver and heart damage, and it's very difficult, that's 10, 20 years down the line, so I've had debates with various bodybuilders. In the short term, you know, they can control their symptoms, and you know, they know as much as the doctor, but the longer term, it's very unclear. And of course, that links in exactly into the cigarette argument, in the sense, because there's no short term, well, apart from the, the difficulty in, in running faster, but the longer term health benefits. And, and when you're making that decision to do AAS now, we don't have enough good clinical data because we're not allowed to do the randomized control clinical. And because it's, we don't know, and it's all anecdotal, and it's all not just YouTube studies, but all case studies n equals one. We don't know the longer term damage, and it could be quite, you know, it could, it could be relatively serious. I mean, in the sense of probably worse than cigarettes. So we don't know that. Um, that's my, that would be my concern about AAS, not so much the short term, but in terms of the society. Elite sport, different question, but in terms of society. That's a question down there. Uh, thank you. Um, Owen, I thought I'd use you as the chair to decide which of my many questions might need to be uh, <laughs> okay. put to the uh, panel, or maybe all of them, who knows. Uh, given that the medal chase has corrupted the Olympic Games, wouldn't cheating under a neutral flag be the way forward is question number one. Question number two, Chris, you'll like this one. If meldonium is the equivalent to statins in Western society, why isn't Viagra banned in sport? That has a proper chemical meaning, as you know. Yeah. And then, uh, aren't we all really kidding ourselves trying to treat sports the same in respect to the prohibited list and sanctions, given that actually sports are all different and so are athletes? And so the more we treat them as generic, the more we're likely to go to the lowest common denominator, which is cheating. Why don't we put one of those questions to each of the panel and do it like that, which will be... Uh, so, so, Nicole, do you, want, do you want to take that last question about the universal code, if you like? So, I, mean, I think it's, a, it's an interesting debate, isn't it? Because obviously in 1999, we started to set up WADA, we started to have a universal code that would basically try and treat all countries and all sports and all athletes the same. Has that now outlived its usefulness in, it, in some ways, or do you think the, um, the point is still a, or, the, or the end goal is still a good one? Well, I think the end goal is the good one, but I, my, I think my, I don't disagree with Michelle in that, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, you just start to blast open a, a whole new debate into a, a, to, to this issue, and I know that it's one that I think the World Anti-Doping Agency have even discussed about whether you just have, at the moment, for those of you who don't know, there is a, a list of stuff that's banned in competition, um, uh, and there's a stuff that's, that's banned in and out of competition. So there are some substances that you can take when you're not competing, but won't betide you if they're still in your system when you compete. Um, but, uh, so it's complex, and there, there's a discussion about whether you just have just a broad blanket. It's banned at all times, which is, you know, interesting for your stimulant substances mm. and your, your cold remedies and things like this. I, 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 don't, I don't think there's a right or a wrong on this one, and it might be that given the way that the world of generally of anti-doping is going, that that's, that's a, a discussion or a, a debate that needs to be had again. And, and you also think, get into the legal arguments around kind of, you know, restraint of trade and so on, which yeah. is why originally the whole sort of lifetime ban thing... Exactly. I mean, I, I, I don't... I think you have to have harmony of, of sanctions across countries if you're looking at the sports, not necessarily harmony of sanctions across, the, I guess what I'm saying is if you're from you know, France and you're a footballer, then if you take the same substances and you're a footballer in Iceland, then <laughs> it should be oh, treated you, the you same. get the second ban yeah. and then do the Iceland <laughs> Is there any chance to <laughs> <you> get <laughs> Iceland tested? <laughs> it should be treated the same. I, I think it would undermine the process 
if there was a if you start to implode the whole purpose of that one code mm. um, well you do hear some sports argue i mean i've heard athletics are ironically given their problems i've heard a said co-argue recently and say well we got we, we were at four year a four-year ban we got argued down to two by other sports that, that you know yeah. that wanted like penalty. I mean, and actually we should have stayed at four which is what I, we're back I, up to I, now. I mean Michelle will know you go back 15 years and I mean countries were doing whatever they wanted to do yeah. and how is that right that uh, you know a, a weightlifter from this country gets six months and then a weightlifter from somebody or uh, even worse a cyclist from a different country for something far less serious is getting a greater sanction. But, I mean, it's bonkers. But the sports that had the life ban didn't have the problems they have now. So rowing has kind of tripped along into a life, you know, from a life ban to a lower sanction. Mm. And, and I would also say, sorry, you want me to use the microphone? I would also say, you know, having worked to, with various sports, this whole this whole sort of fraud, really, of an in and out of competition list is ridiculous. It's a tripwire for athletes. And we looked at it with uh, one of the sports I work with, professional golf, and the golfers said, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. And so they went for the full list all the time. And it makes sense to them because it's how you are in and out of competition. What does competition really mean? It's so sports specific that it's about time, in some respects, that anti-doping itself grew up and was actually addressing these issues. And, you know, a, a four-year ban for um, a rower is not like a four-year ban for a darts player, let's face it. So we've got to be a little bit more um, specific in the way we're yeah, going to deal with Yeah, there's a sort of related point there as well, which is basically that you, know, that you end up catching low-hanging fruit, don't you? That you end up yeah. catching a lot of athletes who have tripped up on Sudafed or supplements and maybe not catching the guys. And, and we, haven't, we haven't moved away from... I mean, I see that recently UCAD uh, applied a penalty to someone for an asthma inhaler for the very same asthma inhaler the United States just days ago gave a warning. Mm. So is that fair? We're not really being fair, let's face it. Andy, you're, so is the contention with the neutral flag? Is, there, is the contention that basically you'd have a you'd have a uh, team competing at the Olympics that where is basically Andy's anything goes team, and they compete against countries that are regulated by uh, by WADA? Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. Um, Everybody in the same shirt last night. That's what we want. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I thought you meant to have all countries without any national flags whatsoever. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think uh, interesting. Right. So, 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 so basically, there's no, there's no longer any country by Nation. country affiliation. No, no national anthems. Yeah. No. Right. I mean, the thing, the you know, I mean, the funny thing is that the medal table doesn't exist, by the way. Um, the IOC does not publish mm. a medal table for the Olympic Games. It is entirely a product of the media and its construction of this theatre of spectacle that is the Olympic Games, which we all enjoy, whether or not we think someone's doping or not. And that, that's, you know... So, so the idea of, of athletes competing under a neutral flag, the problem with it is that sport is underpinned by these nationalist interests. And if you take that, it's like pulling the, you know, the rug from under sport, it will just collapse, and that wouldn't be such a bad situation if it can rebuild and embrace some other values. Like, you know, the most viewed sport online at the moment is parkour, which is trying to get recognition as an official sport. And uh, inline skating is another one. There's lots of new ways in which people are becoming physically active that have nothing to do with that history of sport that is around the Olympic Games. And I think that um, before we get to a point where you have no nations, we will get to a point where people just won't be interested in the so-called fastest person in the world. It will just not be about that. It will be about something completely different. And actually, I think the values of the Olympic Games in particular um, lead us to that situation. The modern Olympic Games as a social movement that is about bringing together the youth of the world is losing touch with that community. And we see that in the dwindling numbers of participation in all kinds of sports. But that's all, but, but you're, you're mixing up there against participation and spectacles. So people might want to watch parkour, but they wouldn't go to a stadium and watch people compete to do parkour to win a medal. Would they? Well, I mean, that's, yeah, that's a slightly different point. But I think that, again, the, um, we are moving from an era of spectatorship to an era of participatory spectatorship. And we see that within these younger sports where it's not just about doing or watching, it's also about capturing and creating. And, and you, know, you see that in, in, in many of these new sports. People don't want to just sit and watch something anymore. You know, broadcasters around the games are not planning 
for audience to be sitting there watching the content 100% of the time. At least 50% you're looking at a phone. So there's a sense in which you are, the entire ecosystem of modern, of, of 21st century sport is changing. And you see that in the practice of broadcasters. Spectatorship is on its way out. So we'll come in on either of those points and then address the, uh, the Viagra question. Well, yeah, I think we, we discussed with who's going to take which of Michelle's question. Is there, and, you know, Nicole took the first one, you, you'd take the medals, and as the 50-year-old male, I'd take Viagra. Which is <laughs> not a bad idea. So, I mean, I mean the Viagra is a technical scientific question. I think Viagra, as originally designed, is quite similar to meldonium and therefore could be potentially performance-enhancing because it ends up being more beneficial for the isozyme or the enzyme that's in the penis, it's probably less likely. But it is a borderline. It clearly could be performance enhancing, I think I say it in my book. Um, and it could be banned. Um, but is it going to have a, it might have a minor performance enhancing benefit in certain sports. So it's a, that's one of those very technical issues. And I imagine if there was a, I don't know, if it, it probably wouldn't, actually it's not difficult to pick up. So I imagine that if it was picked up, that lots of people were taking it, because they are taking Viagra anyway. Um, but if lots of people take a bag in certain specific sports, it would get picked up and could be banned in the same way as Sudafed. I mean, I don't think it's a different. I mean, it's a, it's a drug that is available and is easy to get. So is that, was that the question? It was just te- no, I mean, no. Oh, sorry. It was interesting, interesting to hear you on Viagra. Um, <laughs> I am on but, yeah. um, Seriously. On Viagra. <laughs> Ser- seriously. Um, but it, it, given that meldonium in, in Eastern yeah. Bloc countries actually is technically uh, an equivalent of statins in the Western okay. world. And statins, obviously, are fairly controversial. People are put on statins well, I don't think it as is. a preventive I, 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 so, measure. So my yeah. understanding of meldonium is, although some people are put on it for a longer time, it's supposed mm. to be for a short time. And statins are, are, a lot, are some people, it's a lifetime, and if some doctors had their way, it's very, very controversial. It would be it most, certainly I'd be on statins, just, but just they want to <laughs> dope everyone with statins yeah. um, at my age. And in the US, my brother, who's you know, older than me, but was asked to put on statins quite early on. I think that statin revolution is going to, come, is going to move away. Um, it's one of those things, uh, and to, be, to be more targeted. So I'm not quite, so if the whole population's on statins, of course, above a certain age, then I think the issue, the issue relates much more to, um, I think, age, um, older athletes doing elite sport, and, they, and that's a bigger issue because um, they take much more medication for benefit, and, and the wireless may not work with them, and clearly, you know, we've had cases of people taking testosterone for performance enhancing, performance enabling, and they'll say, well, I should be, because many doctors give you testosterone as a, as a, as a male, because your levels go down. And actually, there is no clinical benefit of taking testosterone or growth hormone when you're older, but a large parts of the population in countries take it, and then you have an issue, but that's, I don't think that's just life. I mean, and, and there are issues around age-related sport. I don't know, it's um, being tied in with well, but in those cases, they are, they are being given by doctors. So in that sense, they are being exactly what Andy would say. I mean, they're, they're doctors suggesting. Now, it's not clinically required, but doctors are giving it. But I mean, if I could just come in on that very quickly. I think that, for me, it's, I, I work a lot in this kind of broader uh, frame of, of human enhancement. And I've got friends that, you know, I've, I've been literally trying to explore the possibility of immortality and life extension. And as crazy, I mean, funny enough, one of these guys, we don't talk about life extension anymore because it's a bit nutty, but we talk about health extension. And we want to all live longer lives and be healthier over a significantly more, a longer period of those lives. We are embarking, we are already embarked into a project where we accept the use of technology, science, medicine to allow us to live longer, healthier lives. The project of human enhancement is part and parcel of that. If you reject that, then you know, reject anti-aging, uh, uh, age-related disease uh, therapy, reject all these things that are about trying to extend the quality of your life. If you want to embrace it, then I think you have to be part of this, um, uh, this, this broader project, which is more radical. I want to live in Andy's world. <laughs> it's spectacularly, I mean, well, we are spectacularly, scientists talk about aging as a disease now. We are spectacularly now. bad at doing what you say. And spectacularly good at studying life science and spectacularly bad despite masses of resources going in, into it and doing what you think is an obvious thing for science to do. We are just spectac- like we're spectacularly bad at gene therapy and gene doping. It's just really difficult. But the fact that we're bad about it, are bad at doing it, doesn't mean we're not trying to do it. We're trying to do it. I'm just saying we, we I, are I trying to extend bad, No, I'm happy to do it. Just like, I think, sort of, but, think you're waving a magic wand that we, no, we no, scientists can do No, no, I'm not saying that at all. This. I'm just saying that we are, we are already committed to this project. 
of human enhancement, life extension, quality of life uh, of improvement. Well, yeah. Yeah. But you know, that is <laughs> you know, a, a, a well, uh, one question here, and then we'll come back down here. Hi, um, this is a question for Andy. Uh, I'm just wondering where you sit um, on sports such as boxing, where there's the added implication of the person you're competing against being harmed mm. because of doping. Um, and then moving on from that, I guess, um, as well as combat sports, contact sports as well, such as rugby, football, mm. where someone could potentially be harmed. Sorry, is your question that within these sports, the drugs harm them or so the doping free, harms them? In yeah. free fall. Yeah. As so, opposed to the sport so itself. When, yeah, when David Price, yeah. as an example, got knocked up. Yeah. And he, he was, Tepper was found to be um, using steroids. So I'm just thinking your sort of yeah. idealistic world, <laughs> yes. how that would fit in. I, I mean, mean, boxing would, would... Boxing is far from being an idealistic world. So... Well, I'm, not, I'm not sure what your point is, that, that these athletes are... Someone on steroids some, could hurt somebody more, more than someone than not on steroids. Oh, yes. oh, that's, that's the point. So if, if they were allowed That they're to, more aggressive, that there's more... Yeah. More, more doing harm. Well, yeah. pe people could die, couldn't they? From they could, yeah. And, and I think that... So, so it's a question about the, le the level of acceptable harm within boxing. Yes. Um, it's well beyond where it should be. And, and again, the point about our ability to modify sports to reduce the harm is where we should focus our attention. I think to some extent, boxing has done that over the years. But if, if drug taking or if doping allowed someone to be more aggressive and, I guess, more violent, which is, of course, the express purpose of the sport, although boxers would say in a controlled way, um, then you would do more to protect the athlete within this circumstance. I mean, I think that boxing is about trying to uh, manage a series of skills and outwit your opponent. I don't think it's about trying to... I don't think it should be about trying to just kill somebody else. So... So I have no problem with, with drug taking or doping, making someone more aggressive, but I think we would have to protect each, each fighter more effectively within that situation. But you've also seen, I mean, the, the, rugby, that, the rugby point is an interesting one because the, in rugby, obviously, yeah. you've already alluded to the fact that people, you know, the, the shape of players is changing in the professional era, they're doing more supplements, they're doing more bodybuilding and so on. Yes. If you took, if you add, if anything goes, scenario into that equation where they're all they're also taking steroids and surely you just increase the chances they're banging into each other they're going to do each other more damage yeah, I, I mean i mean what's the what's the proposition that if you take this drug or the substance that you can punch harder or punch more frequently in, yeah. then i think that again again the, it's a very simple response you do more to protect the athlete how would you do that in the same way that we've done it over the years you have much more supervision within the ring you have much more protection of the athlete I mean, I, I find it hard to see that we can... You're not find creating it. an extra problem. I mean, can you surely... No, no, the, no, because it becomes then a matter of your ability to outmaneuver your opponent, not about your ability to withstand impact. And that is, for me, what the skills of boxing are about. Although I've got colleagues that will say boxing is far from being a sport anyway. But I think that's what you would do. You would modify the... I mean, the same with actually, you know, with tennis over the years. People have talked about the increased speed of the, tennis, the male tennis serve and try to adjust the sport in accordance with that because reaction times haven't, haven't increased. So you have to adjust the parameters of the sport to take into account those enhancements within the athlete playing the sport. That, for me, is, is not problematic. I don't see any problem with trying to protect each fighter more effectively whilst also allowing them to be more efficient as fighters. They're not, they're not incompatible. He's on steroids. How would you protect the other boxer? Would you ask the referee to, I don't know, um, when he tries to, when the other boxer gets tired and he's on the ropes getting battered, would you, would you ask the referee I mean, to just wave off the fight? Isn't that what happens in boxing? Yeah, but then I mean, the, the other guy would win and that would be cheating. <laughs> That's but, the whole point. The, hang on, the situation <laughs> that you're proposing is where one athlete is taking the drugs and the, the other fighter isn't. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, no, if I'm anyone was allowed to take drugs, I think it's yeah. important. Yeah. In both cases, the, the referee the, would, would judge when someone is being unreasonably harmed and would stop the fight, as happens now. Okay. <laughs> um, let's go to Sophie, and then a question here, and then one there, and then... Hi, Andy. Sorry, another one for you. I think this is a fascinating debate, but one of the things I want to ask you is, have you thought about what happens when an athlete stops competing? So in your world where doping is, is legal and um, 
athletes are taking performance enhancing substances which their body then becomes accustomed to because they need to enhance their performance what happens when that athlete stops competing? Where's the duty of care for the athlete in terms of monitoring their health because their body has become accustomed to taking substances? So, so what happens when these athletes stop? I mean, the duty of care towards athletes from sports federations and the sports administrative system is far below where it needs to be. That it's just, you know, for me, a question about what's fundamentally wrong with elite sports today. And so, yes, I've thought about those implications and I'm concerned about those longer-term health risks as I'm concerned about the long-term health risks of elite sport participation generally. And I think that, you know, if, the, if there's anything we've learned from this year is that we can't make any assumptions about the levels of prevalence of doping within sports or the levels of corruption that underpins that sport administration to the extent that all sports federations are sufficiently corrupt. We have no capacity to develop a system that is effective, safe, or indeed respects the interests long-term and medium of those athletes. So it's a question of governance within sport that would allow the system I described to flourish. And at the moment, we are well below where it needs to be. And arguably, sports federations should not be self-governing. And I think you know, that is a huge shift in terms of what sport looks like at the moment. But it is a required shift in order to make sure that we can protect those interests. Do you not think it's wider than the governance issue, though? This is a medical issue. Who is going to medically look after those athletes when they stop competing to make sure that they are not facing undue side effects? And do you not think that will then start to put undue pressure onto an already bursting health system? What bursting health system? I mean, the, I mean we we're talking about sport, first of all. Okay? I mean, what, <laughs> well, let's, let's focus I on... I don't want to live in your world. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just playing devil's advocate. Yeah, I'm just no, playing I, I guess, it out for the debate. I guess, I guess if you think that sports put enough money into protecting the interests of athletes, then, then great. I don't think they do. I think there's you know, billions of pounds within sports and very little of it goes towards taking care of athletes. So if you really commit to that idea, then you know, that needs to change already. We see some intimations of that where in recent you know, fiascos with doping, revelations that in fact, oh yes, we were told eight years ago that in Beijing everyone's being caught, we're all okay, everything's clean. Eight years later, it's not the case. So if you want, and now we're hearing discussions about putting more money, money into WADA. I mean, 15 years, no, 11 years ago, the, at the American Academy of Pediatrics made a very simple point, that, which actually came up in the first uh, half of today, that the problem or the situation of uh, performance enhancement or, or aesthetic enhancement is not a sport problem. It's a cultural phenomenon. So, yeah, you might say it's a, it's a, it's a stressed out system. But if you approach it just by trying to solve the problem in sport, you're not going to solve anything because it's part of a bigger public health concern. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a stress system in public health terms. I don't think it's a stress system in sport terms. It's just about where money gets diverted. And we hear already, sorry, final point, um, <laughs> that uh, there's an argument to be made for sponsors to put more money into anti-doping. You know, come on. There are billions of dollars, pounds, op euros operating around this situation and they're not being diverted to, to attend to those concerns that you have, which I also share. Hiya. Um, I just wanted to agree with uh, Professor Meyer about oh. the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> about get this guy a drink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I believe that the, the health of the athlete is what's paramount here. And I think if you were to try and rule out drugs and push it further underground, then you're going to get less quality drugs and it's going to damage the athlete's health even further. Um, I believe there needs to be an attitude change towards drugs' role in sport. And, I mean, when was WADA set up? 2003? 1999. Sorry? 1999, was it? 98, 99. 98, 99. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked. There needs to be some radical change in WADA, starting from the governance all, all the way down. Lovely. But my main question is about supplements. I know um, you mentioned it earlier. Um, why is it so hard to try and regulate supplements and rule out all these steroids and stimulants that keep on turning up in, in supplements when they're not on the label, they're not listed on the label? Um, and what, are, what steps are UCAD doing to try and eradicate this from the supplement industry? So uh, the, the role that we play is to purely, I mean, we can't stop athletes, sports people, the general public taking supplements. That's not our remit. So what we do is we say to them, first and foremost, you have to look at whether you nutritionally 
need to take a supplement. If you are not getting what you need from a good, balanced, nutritional diet, okay, speak to somebody about supplements to find out what allegedly you therefore need to take to aid your recovery or, 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 or whatever you're lacking in your diet. At the point that you make the decision to take a supplement, do some due diligence. And we have something called Informed Sport, which is uh, uh, an organization that batch tests supplements to give them some degree of, um, well, I guess a certainty is probably the wrong word, but to say, look, if you're faced with this wealth of choice about supplements, go to somewhere that have done some batch testing to say, look, we've done some batch testing and we're not seeing X, Y, Z in it. So if you're faced with a choice of something from the informed sport list or something from China about which you know nothing about, go to the informed sport list and it mitigates, it reduces your risk. No manufacturer right now is putting their money where their mouth is and saying, we will produce a supplement and stand behind it and say that no matter what, this product is clean. Anybody who buys anything out here right now that has, that it's either IOC approved or WADA approved, it's lies. Because at the moment, the IOC do not approve any supplements. WADA do not approve any supplements. No organization right now approves a supplement. And that's because the components of a supplement are coming from all over the world. And they come into a, a factory, I'm putting this down into real bare basics, I'm sure it's far more sophisticated than this, shipping it in from all over, the conditions about which that one ingredient has been manufactured or packaged is absolutely unknown. So if, it's, if you just take one element of a substance that's coming into, let's say, a, a factory in the UK, and that has been run alongside some steroids or some other prohibited stuff, it could well be contaminated. And that's why no manufacturer right now is going to say, I will absolutely rubber stamp this and say, sue me if you take this supplement and get uh, an adverse finding from it. Just very quickly, yeah. Um, when you're saying that no one knows where this is coming from, are you not asking the questions to the supplement companies or is WADA not trying to find out where this is coming from so someone actually knows? But, you know, when you look at the, the composition of, a, of a, a supplement, some of it is just vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C. I mean, even that, which on the face of it is completely harmless... You can do is being manufactured all, all around the, the world in companies where, I mean, if you think right. that a company can go and do due diligence all of the time, 365 days a year, about what is being produced in these factories all around the world, you, I, forget it. No, that, and that's why nothing is kite marked, nothing comes with any degree of, 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 of certainty when it comes to supplements. And you're right, it's a nightmare. But that's the reality of what we're facing at the moment. I mean, just as a quick, I, mean, I, I guess, in my world, um, <laughs> <laughs> how expensive would it be to develop a personal analytics kit that each athlete can have and put their substance into and see what's in it? I mean, yeah, it well, might take impossible. a while. Impossible. Right? Yeah, well, <laughs> in a sense, okay. well, yeah, I mean, you need a mass spec. So, yeah, so impossible to create. That's why you have a wad at lab. I mean, so that's why the Russians had a whole separate lab. So the, the answer, to create a little kit that would, yeah. or all the kind of contaminants in there, impossible. So right? in the same way that, you know, 20 years ago, it cost two and a half billion pounds to map a genome, and now it's less than, you know, a thousand. The the genome's a linear problem. This is not, I mean, so it's, it's more, but it's, so sometimes people get a fact, said with the human genome, actually, it was rather trivial, back in inverted commas, bit of technology. But once you, but in the sense that it's a linear set of codes. But the problem with these, so, so the question, are you saying, do we check the supplements? Of course, in one sense, they, they, they've got to be safe to eat. Right, put in your mouth. So there's a checking of. If you're asking, can you check us up? So a small contaminant would not pass a WADA test. You have to do a WADA test, and you have to therefore have all the mass specs and have all the systems in place. So otherwise, there's no point. You're in an intermediate zone. Now, some supplements companies will that claim they don't have performance enhancing, they have steroids in them, will probably put a little bit of steroid in them because they'll work better, even though they claim they haven't got steroids in. That's the real you know, black market, or black market, but the dark end of the supplement industry. Um, 
but they have to be safe. You know, they, arguably, they've got to, if you take them on the shelf, the Holland and Barrett, they've got to be safe to eat. So there's a whole set of regulations around that, but they haven't got to work. You know, this is a big issue, and, and if you go to the in, the in the UK and Europe, you can't claim they do all these wonderful things because there's regulations. In the US, you can claim everything about supplements. If you go, if you walk into a drugstore or pharmacy in the US, all these supplements, all these wonderful things they do, they just say the FDA doesn't doesn't approve this, doesn't agree with it. You can claim anything you like without proving it works. So the supplement industry is is a massive industry, um, and and it, why should it do what WADA want it to do? I mean, it's you know. Because they are linked to the drug, some of the drug companies also have smaller arms. Yeah. Than it's a complicated, big area. We could do another hour. Yeah, you could do another hour. Yeah. I, I would say you don't need to. Use, I mean, the bottom line actually is that probably even in elite sport, you don't really need to take supplements to to be able to run faster and and and, and even to get a good good body. You don't need now. If you want to go to the level where you're where you're looking at, there you probably do. But as, you know, and if you want to do the Tour de France, it's, they're rather specialist things. But in general, in life. The supplement industry is, is a bit of a myth. You don't need it to be a normal, healthy human being and to performance enhance, to get anything. It's, but elite sport, the very top end, mm. is, is a specialist thing, and you might well need it. We haven't got long, so let's a couple more short questions. We've got two here in the front. We've been waiting for a while on the left. And then... My question is mainly for Nicole, actually. What's your opinion on the fact that some countries want to make taking athletes that take um, drugs a criminal offence? Look, I, I get why some countries take that stance. We're having a similar discussion with the, the UK government at the moment. Our view here in the UK, generally, I'm sensing is that we have enough legislation but it's about identifying where the gaps are in that legislation to see if we just need to, to, to fill some gaps. Um, what we're hearing from discussions that we have had in the past and, and prior to the London Olympic Games in, in 2012 was that, that the police are under-resourced. They've got competing priorities. And if you're looking at things like people trafficking or gun crime um, and then you've got us knocking at the door going yeah well we think somebody's doping it's coming way way down on their list of priorities and you can't just have legislation if you're not going to enforce it and it's not going to be meaningful I mean we've got this fantastic piece of legislation that makes it an offence for any of you to use your mobile phones with you know hold your phones in your cars how many of you have held your phones in your cars no action, is there? Until there's action. <laughs> but until somebody, the police start stopping people and prosecuting them for that, it's, you know, it's meaningless legislation. So we can go through the motions of criminalising doping in sport, but it's got to have the weight of the, the law behind it. Play the next team. Um, so just to play devil's advocate here, we've all seen in the news about the Russian state doping and how the whole coaches and the system there has developed such that the athletes in athletics now won't be able, at least most of them, to take part in Rio. Um, so just how do you think... Well, we also heard last year allegations against Mo Farah mainly against his coach, but that also rubbed off against him as an athlete. And I'm just picking on him as an example because he's sort of lauded as a great British runner, a great British talent and athlete. So if we look at Russia and we say that their whole system with their coaches and their whole entourage really reflects on the individual athletes, what's your opinion on how Mo Farah's coach reflects on him as an athlete? And would he be well placed to represent our country in the Olympics? Nicole? Oh, I think I should go last on this <laughs> one, actually. I am the obvious choice to answer this question. Let's go down the line. I think Nicole can answer it, but it's unfair to ask Nicole to answer it. Um, I, so, I, the, the problem is I can't even answer it because the Salazar case is still going on, as I understand. So yeah. It's really difficult to answer because you're making accusations about Salazar and he's going through US anti doping. So. <laughs> no, no, well, Panorama, but, but, but the implication in what you're yeah. saying. So it's a very really important actually, because I, I do say, because I, when I give my lecture to students, I do say, just because I'm naming somebody next to something else doesn't mean the doping. So, so there is an allegation about Salazar, right, Alberta Salazar, Mo Farah's coach, 
Um, that is unproven. So you're suggesting that Mofarar shouldn't represent us because he, has, he, he is associated with a coach who coaches other athletes, and that coach has got unproven accusations against him. And I could list any number. If I speak to a journalist, not obviously not you, but other journalists <laughs> who, are, who aren't sports journalists, they will list every single athlete who, does, who wins a medal as doping, yeah. right, as cheating, right? And they to tell you for sure, almost for sure. Now, not, that's the, not really the sports journalists who know a bit more, but it is a general thing. And it's just a non-question. I don't think you're allowed to answer that question whilst not just you know whilst tumbles unproven. It's just otherwise there is no sport. It's the Chris Froome question, right? Mm. So, so. Chris Froome wins the Tour de France, he must be doping. And it's just like, well, then there's no point. I mean, you have to, you have, to have evidence. And, uh, you know, and as a scientist, you know, that's what I think as well. And, and of course the, so I don't think... So you need to give me an example that is more... I mean, I, you, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, well, there are athletes who have worked with other uh, coaches who have been doping. I mean, of course, the, the issue that Team Sky had was that it tried to have a team that had no connection with doping at all, and that failed, because mm. in, in cycling it was always impossible, so some coaches came in, and they, they had some point in the past, mm. so then is that tar, that's that part of the whole into, team. Is it I, think, historical I think that's a legitimate or, question then about, about where you go with that, and certainly, um, I can't remember, the athletes who went with an East German coach as well, so there's an issue around that, so there are live questions where you can raise that, and I think, you know, should you, if you associate with people who've been known to cheat, should that be a problem? Um, I think it's a live question. But the Mo Farah question, I don't think it's fair. So, I, so I'm taking away from you and you ask because it's not fair because the, even the coach has not been yeah, proven. And therefore, I don't know how we can answer it. And Chris is spot on. So until a case has been proven against somebody, it's all... Well, so, but I would, would say that the World anti Code has provision about prohibited association. So if you are associated with somebody who has been banned... Um, certainly, UK Anti Doping, we will write to that athlete to say, you need to disassociate yourself from that individual. Mm. You've got a certain amount of time to do it. And if not, then we're going to come back at you and put a spotlight on you and say, why are you still hanging out with somebody who is, is banned at this particular moment um, in time? And with Russia, I mean, the case was, wasn't it, that the, 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 it's an exceptional scenario in a sense, in that the, it's been decided that the system was so rotten that any of those individual athletes couldn't possibly have not been tainted by it, if you like. But I think it's a... But the, sort of, the broader question you raised, I think, is an interesting one too, which is basically, we've got to be careful not to become blinded by patriotism here as well. You know, you can't mm. sit and see these things in country-specific terms because, mm. you know, the danger is that Russia do become the bogeyman and any kind of, you know, any allegations against our own athletes are sort of, you know... Well, we have how many people you got on the? I mean, on the UK ban list, there's a huge, not well, a huge number, yeah. but a significant number. So we, we, you know, we, we have athletes who are cheating in our country. So. I mean, I would just say yeah. that um, you know, I sometimes secretly hope people like Mo Farah would be found guilty of doping, because if the nicest guys in sport are doing it too, then you know there must be something inherently wrong with the system. And, of course, he wouldn't ever be put forward if he were found guilty. If anyone was found guilty, they wouldn't represent the nation in the present system. But, you know, unless these idols fall, um, then I think we won't fund... I mean, imagine it did happen. Imagine Usain Bolt was then brought up, or Mo Farah was brought up on a charge. How would we feel about sports then? Would it collapse? Would people stop watching? I don't think they would. I disagree. But anyway, that would that'd be a much but longer they debate. Oh, and they haven't. Many athletes have been found guilty. And we still watch. I think, I think watch. athletics is a particular case. And I think if Usain Bolt was found oh. to have uh, to have doped throughout his career, it would be a hammer blow for that sport. But the audience will go up. No. True. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. People still watch athletics. Less of them than used to. They're not playing as much as they did. They were watching parkour. <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to draw it to a close there because we've run over time already. But thanks ever so much to, to all three of you. If I could just quickly go along the line and ask you for, for one Ooh. thought to, uh, to send people away with. I mean, I, mean I, I, I think very interesting. We sort of had a theoretical debate between kind of, you know, Andy's world and Nicole's <laughs> world. And, I, you know, I think that, that debate will continue. But within that, there's a, there's a separate debate about, you know, whether or not... Um, whether or not the system we've got is working. And I think we'd all agree that that system needs more resource, but it also needs a fundamental overhaul of governance, which both Andy and Nicole said in different ways, really. And that unless you solve that, you can't necessarily solve some of the other issues we're talking about. But certainly, it's not going away. Um, and if, so just very quickly, one final thought from, from each of you, and then we'll wrap up. Well, uh, sorry, I don't feel I should say a big science talk. Mm -hmm. I, I just kind of say, don't let 
you know, physical activity is good for you. I feel like saying, oh, you know, and anyway, so don't worry. You know. So I feel like, are you saying, when you, when you, I love people not to be spectators, but to be joint spectators and, and consumers. So, and if elite sport makes you more active, which we know it doesn't really, right. anyway, but just, just be active because it's healthy. And, you know, and I think, uh, you know, I feel like I'm saying don't take supplements, but I mean, that's a, so most supplements are a waste of money. Why don't we leave that as a good public most, service Most announcement. supplements yeah. are, a, are a waste of money. Oh, let, let's leave that. I'll say that. It's a biochemist. Most supplements are a waste of money. Um, okay, um, I am so sick of this debate. <laughs> I, I can't tell you. I mean, I, you know, my mother always said to me, just stop talking about this issue. You know, you're not going to progress in life and your career if you keep making these arguments and talking about sport in this way. And I often get painted as the kind of outsider. You know, I grew up with sports. I played every sport as a school kid. I was in every team. I invest a lot of my life into developing sports, work a lot with the International Olympic Committee in, in building its community and its work. And, um, and I guess I just see that fundamentally this anti-doping project isn't working. And, um, and it is so much of a dogma within many of the... Co Actually, tonight I think it hasn't been so much, but there is such a strong position. It's like, you know, telling people just who believe in God, just, you know, if you're going to a church, say, just stop, it doesn't exist, you know, just stop believing. But that is the, the wall I find myself up against all the time, and I'm kind of tired of it. But I think there's a fundamental point about social change that underpins it, which is why I'll keep talking about it. <laughs> I really respect individuals like Andy who come at this from a completely different perspective. Because it challenges. It challenges is organisations like UK Anti-Doping. It challenges the world that anti-doping organisations operate within. I'm not saying that I have any desire to enter into Andy's world anytime soon, or that I will be encouraging people to do that. But I think what anti-doping has to do is constantly challenge itself and evolve and look at things differently. Um, and that means you've got to learn, you've got to see people's different points of view. So onwards Excellent. and upwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all to you, uh, for your excellent questions and thank you for our panel.